everyone, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. When I think of public service, the first thing that comes to mind is our first responders. Police, paramedics, firefighters, and others are the first ones on the scene of an emergency, utilizing their special training and service to the community. Now, while these men and women are trained to respond to natural disasters and other emergencies, are they trained in dealing with incidents involving UAP or UFOs? Today, we have two special guests here to discuss that very issue. But first, please hit the subscribe button and thumbs up button on YouTube. You can also find us on Twitter at Good Trouble Show and all other social media platforms at The Good Trouble Show. You can also find us on your favorite podcasting platforms. And if you would like to pitch in and keep the lights on here, you can become a supporter of The Good Trouble Show by going to www.patreon.com forward slash The Good Trouble Show. And for the price of a coffee, you can support our work. And actually, we, we received a, a message from a, a viewer here on, on YouTube that said, hey, uh, please support the mom and pop coffee shops, uh, not the Starbucks. And that's actually what I tend to do. So we thought we would change that up a bit. So uh, yeah, we, we love our mom and pop uh, businesses, no matter restaurant, coffee, whatever, uh, whatever it is. Uh, we love what you do. And finally, on YouTube, our Super Chats are open and are a great way to show your financial appreciation for our work. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our financial supporters on Patreon and YouTube. And of course, as always, our chat moderators who volunteer their time, take time away from their families over the weekend to keep the, uh, the riffraff out of our chat rooms. Okay, so onward. So our two special guests are joining us today uh, to discuss UAP phenomenon and our first, responser, uh, our first responders. Please welcome former NYPD officer and assistant commissioner, former assistant commissioner for the New York City Correction uh, Department and law enforcement professional, Dr. Keith Taylor, who is over here on your left at home. And then on your right is author, former manager of the Bass MUFON SIP project for Bigelow Aerospace. It's a mouthful there. And uh, post 9-11, he facilitated the response between federal agencies and our nation's airports. Please welcome on your right there, uh, Richard Lang. Gentlemen, how are you? Great. We're good. Thank We're you. good. Excellent. Well, th thanks for joining us and happy, happy, happy Sunday. It, it's finally, happy Sunday, right. it, it, it's finally drying out slightly here in LA, man. It's, it's, it, it, I swear it feels like it's been, it's, kind of been like Seattle out here, just the, the constant rain. Of, of course, of course, we've needed it. It's, it's you know, been pretty much a you know, pretty dry for quite a long time. But I never thought that I would see see this uh, this much right. rain. Um, anyway, OK, so uh, Dr. Taylor, so you have quite an interesting uh, story that really started post 9-11 and your subsequent training by the Department of Homeland Security. What kind of training specifically did you receive post 9-11 from the uh, DHS and, and how has all of this tied into the UAP issue? Uh, certainly. Uh, and, and I wanted to say it's an honor to be on your show. Uh, Thank you. One of the things that one of the things that was a focus uh, by Homeland Security after 9-11 occurred was stopping terrorist attacks from occurring. And so the training that the Department of Homeland Security provided to first responders included a focus on weapons of mass destruction. And so they provided, FEMA provided training through various training sites throughout the country, and uh, officers could go there free of charge to get the training uh, to allow them to utilize specialized detection equipment to, um, to for radi radi incidents involving radioactive substances, for instance, or chemical substances or biological substances. And so that is the specialized training that I received. It was intensive. I was my unit uh, for a number of years focused on WMD response in New York City. And so I, I received a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, training from the Department of Homeland Security on uh, equipment, on um, tactics, and on policy related to WMD response. 
that, that that sounds like that sounds like probably a lot of information that you were told about that you may not have really wanted to know about what some of the That's dangers true. that our nations nations faced. Uh, now, now, Richard, you've been involved in this for for quite some time. You were, uh, as I said earlier, former manager of the Bass Mufon SIP, and I want to ask you about that SIP project mm -hmm. for Bigelow Aerospace. And you're also the author. You, this is your third book now, uh, and we'll put yeah. it up here. Uh, our, uh, your third book, UFO Investigation, Police, FD, Rescue, First Responders Guide to UFO Encounters. How, how did you get involved? How did you get involved with this whole UAP topic? Well, <clears throat> when I was young, um, my degree, my bachelor's degree is in aeronautics, and I'm a commercial instrument rated pilot. Um, when I was young, again, I'm talking f in, in Florida. I was in flight school. One night flying up the coast of Florida, the East Coast, and um, I basically got in the middle of um, an encounter with a huge UFO that was hovering over the ocean, an airline, an Eastern Airlines flight in a private jet. And, um, you know, I, I've talked about that extensively in my book, how it all went down. But basically, back then, I learned that this this was really going on. And it's been it's been the, the focus of my a, a, a big part of my life. I, I worked in the financial world um, a number of years, and I had very good jobs where I made money and had a lot of vacation time. And I used that to 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 do this research. So I'd say over the last thirty years, I've I've been involved in. Um, you know, I, I I think I said in my book that I've interviewed at least fifty people who have been abducted, and I've looked at thousands of case reports and worked on hundreds of them myself. And um, over the years, I've accumulated a lot of information and, and, and knowledge about the subject. I would say, I think Keith and I were talking the other day, and most of what I write about is based on my own experiences, where things that I've, where I've been involved in cases or interviewed people, um, as opposed to like studying history. I'm not a great historian in that respect and reading other people's books, but most of what, what I've written about is based on the, the experience that I had. Um, I was managing the... Um, it, it, there's an organization, MUFON, which is a, um, you know, it's a UFO research research center that um, people report cases to, and they've been doing it for for you know since the '70s. And um, the in uh, 2008, the Defense Intelligence Agency had put some had serious money up uh, through with the help of Harry Reid, who was the Speaker of the House at the time, and Robert Bigelow, and they put a project together to basically study UFOs, and um, as that all evolved, I was trained to manage part of that program. And, um, you know, that I think that's probably, um, you know, as far as my reputation, that that's probably the biggest thing that's really, you know, propelled me into to, to, to all this, this, you know, the public part of it. But yeah. um, that that's, you know, basically what we were doing is we were looking at, at, at UFO reports that were coming in every day, analyzing them, and then... You know, my job was to send investigators out to, to to work the cases and interview the people. And then we compiled reports that were submitted to the Pentagon. Wow. What's uh, what's what is uh, Robert Bigelow like? I would love to have him on the show. He's got to have a lot of stories, I, I would think. Well, well, the, the, you know, my experience with 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 the team there, um, Mr. Bigelow, they call him Mr. B. He really didn't. On the day, I didn't have much day-to-day -day contact with him. I've met him a few times and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But the guys that worked on, you realize he had 50 people hired on his side of the, what I called the, their mirror. The, the, the project was, it was two parts. There was a non-classified part that I ran. And then there was a classified part on their side where they were operating in a classified um, facility there. And, um, the, the, I've worked with a team of guys, about six or seven guys, where I talk to them every day and we work together. Um, Colin Callahan ran that unit, and he's he's probably the public face of that. Some of the other guys have really not wanted to be identified publicly because they're still doing some of that kind of research, and I totally respect that. But as far as Mr. Bigelow, I've met him a couple times. I really didn't have any chit-chats about anything that he was doing for for what it's worth. Well, Robert Bigelow, if you're watching and you want to come chit chat here, you, you, we always have an open door. We would love to have you. Now, now, Dr. Taylor, how often are 
are first responders responding to UAP incidents? Is there any sort of hard data that would tell us how often this is occurring? Uh, if there is, it's not available to the public. And that is a really important question because when you look at the historical record, you quickly realize that public safety professionals have been reporting UAPs, uh, not just sightings, but contacts and even abductions, uh, and have not really gotten any sort of uh, support for the, that kind of incident that they responded to. That was one of the things that I realized as I started looking into the mm -hmm. historical record and reading the reports and seeing that there are many, many uh, incidents where officers have responded. And because of stigma, I imagine that's only one tenth or one hundredth of the actual amount. So it's probably still going on today, just as it has previously. And the stigma is still as strong or close to that which prevents us from getting an accurate record. Plus, we don't really have a, a formal government uh, accountability, uh, any kind of process formally to report to. So as long as we're not looking, we're not going to know the answers. That sounds like Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, a uh, running arrow, I, I would have to say. So, so really, because I've sort of argued that since all of this has really kind of come to the forefront with David Grush and the congressional hearings and and what we just revealed yesterday, upcoming field hearings. To me, like as far as the general public, it feels as if the stigma is decreasing, but you're not really yeah. seeing that decrease in law enforcement or you think it's still pretty much uh, pretty much there, uh, Keith? Uh, um, uh, I would imagine that it's still uh, pretty much there. I retired a number of years ago, but the subject never came up during my 23 years uh, on, on patrol, and I'd never thought about it. And it wasn't until 2017, New York Times, and all those things uh, that started to get out into the, the public, the videos, and so on, that I, I realized that there's a there there, and this is something to be concerned about. And I also just want to make a point that uh, th there have been uh, great efforts by uh, volunteer organizations like MUFON and others that I, I don't want to give the impression that they, you know, they were there was no place to report to because they were reporting to these uh, entities, but there was no governmental uh, reporting process as you would with any other incident with nine one one. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder in many ways if the sort of lack of, we'll just say, forward thinking in terms of government reporting. For instance, it seems like they've they have been forced, especially the Pentagon, their hand has been forced to give, to lay out a reporting mechanism for our men and women in uniform. You would have thought that they would have done that on their own because you would think that they would care about our well-being of our, our men and women in uniform. And it, it just seems like they've had to be sort of led to the water in, in terms of that. And I wonder if that will really sort of end up changing in terms of any sort of federal guidance t for our first responders, for people that are dealing with the general public when they run into this. Now, now, Richard, one thing that we've heard, for instance, Dr. Gary Nolan speak about, David Grush speak about, are the, the I would say, the, the biological ramifications of encountering UAP close up. Uh, Grush, I think it was Grush, or perhaps it was Dr. Nolan talking about people that approach these objects have radio radiological damage, things things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, tell mm -hmm. us a bit about that as far as how that would relate to our first responders responding to an incident, someone uh, calling up and saying, hey, this is sitting in my backyard or, or you know, anything of that nature. Okay. In my book, and again, that's part of the reason that this book was written is to train people that are in law enforcement to help them understand what's going on with this. And that more important than anything to, to make sure they understand what the hazards would be and how to protect themselves from the, the potential risks of being involved in a close encounter situation. So in my book, I have a chapter, it's chapter eight, and it says what to do and not to do. 
And basically, it talks about the, the there, there's electromagnetic fields that, that are hazardous, there's radiological hazards, there's biological hazards. And so I try to break that down and help someone to understand that, you know, when, when it, what, what could potentially happen is if you're a law enforcement officer, you're out on patrol some night and you're in a count like where I live is a very rural county. So at two o'clock in the morning, somebody calls the dispatcher and says, hey, something crashed out in my pasture where my horses are. And, and you're the guy on duty that night. You're going to go out there and see what's going on to, to check it out. And when you get there, if there is something crashed or something landed there, there's some things that you have to be very careful about. And I specifically outline them in my books. First of all, if you have a, if you have a craft that's not on the, if it's hovering, the propulsion, and I've talked a little bit about this in the book, but it's called electrogravitic propulsion. But it's kind of, it's very similar to microwave. So if you were to walk underneath something that's hovering, the effect would be the same as if you stuck your arm in a microwave oven. That's the kind of skin Not tissue thing <laughs> it would do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You could, well, and it, and it has caused people a lot of health hazards and, and serious injuries and, and illness and even death. So, so that's one of the things that you have to be aware of. And what we've said, what I've said in my book is that if you're an officer, one of the things that we've learned, and again, uh, my world is like looking at cases and the experiences I've had interviewing these people, but there's all kinds of cases out there where someone has an encounter out in a, in a wilderness somewhere, say, and the car gets stopped and there's a craft that's hovering over, around, or near the car. So one individual or a couple individuals get out of the car because they're curious and they're trying to look around and figure it out. And then the other guy is scared to death and he's cowered up and curled up in the back seat on the floor. And um, then, you know, fast forward five, six weeks later, the two guys that got out of the car are coming down with all kinds of illnesses, you know, like tumors and blood clots and cancerous. And the guy that was hiding in the back of the car has no health effects at all. So I think we could say with some certainty and some confidence that if you roll up on something like this, that staying in the car is a really good idea because the metal in the car protects you a lot from the different radiological hazards that 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 might be there. Um, other things that, that you'd want to consider is that if you have something that's like if you have a craft that's on the ground and it's still powered up, it can have um, it can emit um, ultraviolet radiation. Like sometimes people say the skin looks like it has a sheen around it, and that's like ultraviolet energy. If you get close to it, it'll burn your skin like sunburn. And there are some cases where you have um, you have um, radi radiation in like the X-ray spectrum that's strong enough to cause radiation sickness. So again, you want to stay back from those kind of things. And then um, – in in the um, in my book, I've also said that there are cases where people that like in recovery teams and so forth have gotten close, or where an ET is injured and they've picked them up and try to take them to a hospital or a facility somewhere. That close contact, um, it's kind of like if you were to pick somebody up that had some infectious disease and you're transporting them, you'd want to treat them the same way. You'd want to use gloves and masks and all that kind of thing. And the same with recover with body recovery that, that you just want to be very careful to avoid that kind of bacteriological biological the potential for something like that and also um research indicates that when some of these events are occurring um i i, I know that there was a lot of research on the ranch the skinwalker ranch um and you'll see these discharges, like you'll see a, a spike in gamma radiation and also uh, like electromagnetic field radiate, you know. And so like one of the things we've talked about in the book is like it used to be that a radiation detector was like the size of a shoebox. And now they're little this big and they're all digital readout. You can set the, the you can set the um, alarms and all that. And if you have something like that and it's set and it's in your pocket, if it starts beeping, um, then that means that you need to back up, get away from it, you know, that kind of thing. So there's some things like that we've talked about in the books that little little instruments like that could really, you know, protect you from from contamination. And, um, and also um, something that's a little controversial, but I always talk about this, is if you are an officer and you're responding to something like that, 
um, you want to have a mindset of compassion. You know, if, 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 if there really is something crashed and these people are, they're sentient beings, they might be injured or whatever. And if you have a, if you get out of the car and you are feeling compassionate towards them and like have a sense that you want to help them if you can, that kind of thing. I think that goes a long way in, in, in for your own personal safety, you know, and I've even said that, you know, a, a police officer, you have a gun in your duty belt and you really want to keep it in your duty belt. You don't want to be waving it around or pointing it at anybody or anything um, because that could develop, that could be very hazardous. And then, you know, a lot of other things like pointing, um, there's been cases I've personally worked on where people like something is hovering over an area, like one gentleman, he had a huge, triangle craft hovering over his backyard, maybe a couple hundred feet altitude. And he goes in and comes out with one of those uh, million candle power spotlights, like people, you know, and he put it up, flashed it up, trying to see the, you know, get a better look at this thing. And when he did that, a real hot beam of light came down and burned him, you know, so we don't recommend, don't point lasers at him, don't put lights, high intensity flashlights at him. Um, even the cops have those laser speed detectors in there. Don't point that at it either. You know, although there have been, I read a case, a couple of cases where the cops are sitting there and this thing hovers over, <laughs> gets close to them. And the guy's got a laser speed detector and it puts it up on it. And it, and it goes from like two miles an hour to like 600 miles an hour in like three seconds, you know, and wow. they're, they're like, whoa, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I don't recommend doing that, you know, doing that just for safety reasons. But there's a lot of things in the book. It's when I wrote the book, um, I was not, I wrote a, my first book was written to teach people how to investigate cases, but this one is written more to protect the safety of the officers involved, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that, that completely makes sense. Yeah. I might want to get one of those radiation detectors. I've, I've had orbs show up above the house. I would say probably the lowest has been around two, 200 feet above, yeah. above the Keith, house. Keith had, Keith bought one last week too. So yeah, they're uh, like, I, they cost 80 bucks, you know, they're, and they work really good. I would. So after, after this, what I'll do, I'd, I'd love to get a link to where people can purchase one of those. I'm definitely going to purchase one. I've, I've yeah. never sort of felt sick or anything like that. And, uh, and I certainly have not pointed a laser at this thing. That is for sure. Mm. I mean, mm. number one here in LA, and I think it's, it exists everywhere. If you point a laser at a, at a commercial aircraft, it's like a major, major felony. So it's a felony even, now. Yeah. I, I don't even want to risk it, but I certainly don't want to provoke any sort of, any sort of reaction from whatever appears above, above my home. And that's been a they, while. They make these things. Homeland security came out with these. It's like a credit card okay. and, and you just keep it in your wallet. And if you've exposed, it'll, it'll show you how much radiation you've been exposed to. It's kind of really cool. It's a cheap, easy way to do that. And, and, and you can, per, you can purchase this online or. Yeah. I'll send them to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. And then the other thing is this, this picks up magnetic fields and, and microwave energy. Those are the, these are the two meters that most people would use. This is radiation. This is, you know, but um, they're just very handy and, and you can set these things and, and they have alarms so that, you know, even with paranormal type, like if there was something, like you said, if there's an orb that's over your house or something like that, very often, if you have, a, if you have some something like that, that occurs, the, the, you'll, you'll, the meter will show up. Uh, a, a gamma radiation, a spike in gamma radiation, just quick, but it'll set that meter off and it'll start beeping. So you'll know something's going on, you know? Yeah. I, I think it was about day. probably about four or five days before the orb showed up, we started having some really weird paranormal stuff that is, and that tri-field meter would detect that, right? Sort of, mm -hmm. I always heard of, the, of that more for like ghost hunting and things of that nature. Well, it is, but ghost hunting is still, um, you know, there's a line that you draw there between ghost hunt. The paranormal is paranormal and mm -hmm. certain when you have paranormal activity, whether it's ghost hunting or a UFO, there's certain things that occur. You know, one of them is the temperature will drop. And if you read the books about the skinwalker, that's one of the signs. It's like you're walking along, it's nice and breezy and 75 degrees, and then it gets 40 degrees all of a sudden. So, you know, something Anytime there's that that paranormal energy, it it tends to suck the heat up for some reason. 
So we don't completely understand why it works. We just know that when it gets cold, you know, something's coming. And then the same thing with these, these meters will um, show the, the, the magnetic fields and, and, um, and then the, the other one will pick up the radiation. But you have magnetic spikes and radiation spikes when you have paranormal events, even if it's something that occurs at your house. Got it. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be, be getting one of those. Now, I want to go back, uh, Richard, you, you spoke a second ago regarding crash retrievals and bodies or, or people mm -hmm. being contaminated by handling mm -hmm. NHI. Was this something that you were exposed to while you were working for Bigelow Aerospace, or, mm -mm. or is this just stuff mm -mm. you've come across in the common literature? No, no. And let me define that a little bit. I have a section, it's chapter eight in the book is about, um, you know, what to do and not do. Chapter seven is kind of like a scenario about how something like this would unfold. And basically what you're dealing with is that very often when you have some kind of a major UFO event, if you read the case reports, they'll always talk about black helicopters or fighter jets flying around and after them. And that's because like NORAD monitors everything that happens in the airspace above the United States. And very often when something enters into the airspace or materializes in the airspace, they know about it and they dispatch, uh, you know, the, the appropriate type of uh, equipment to check it out. If something crashes, it's really likely they're going to know. And they're going to dispatch what we call reconnaissance units or recon teams to the um, to the area to, to take care of it. And in the research that I did on this, um, it, the first account that I could find was G General MacArthur was head of the Pacific, you know, during World War II, the Pacific. And, and there's an account where he wrote about uh, a recovered a crash that was recovered, and he said it was of extraterrestrial origin. That's what he wrote in his report. He's the first one that I could find that would say that. But basically, during the Truman administration, there were a number of cases where, where craft crashed, and, and they recovered them. So back then, they started um, organizing reconnaissance units. And the first ones were done in Fort Belvoir in Virginia, and now they're they're you know like at Nellis Air there's there's they're scattered around the United States. But these there's they are teams of people that are and Keith and I have talked about this too, where if if, if there's something like it could be a spill of radioactive material or it could be um, an aircraft that has a nuclear weapon that goes down, um, or or it could be a UFO that crashes. That's what these guys do, and they're real good at it, and they've been doing it for a long time. And so if something crashes or lands, they're going to be there pretty fast and, and try to, to, to recover it. And, and so what they're going to do, and, and in my book, what, what I thought was important is if you're dealing with the basic lo local law enforcement guys, the recon units are going to get there first. And they're going to set up a perimeter. And um, when, when they set up a perimeter, they're going to ask the local police to maintain the perimeter and maybe even help with evacuation. And so a lot of times local police might be involved with that, but they might not even be privy to what's really going on inside in the, in the, what, what, what they're really doing. But basically what the, the recon units are going to do, they're going to get there. They're going to uh, light it up and fence it off and all that. And they're going to do tests and, and check what's going on and figure out what, what it is. And, and, um, the, the, and they have people that are, um, you know, experienced in, uh, they call it uh, NBC nuclear biological radio, you know, radioactive, and they've got people that are experts in that. And they also have people that what they can, they're called interfacers, and that's someone that can communicate with an ET telepathically. And so they show up with all this stuff. They're going to analyze everything, and then ultimately, what they want to do is once they get all their their tests done and figure out what's going on, then gather it up and transport it out of there and then and then once the 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 the, the all the crash debris is removed then they're going to clean it up to, to remove any trace of it and then open the perimeter up again but keith we've talked about that in the in the where where you know dealing with radiological stuff that there's teams that that go out and do that kind of stuff that, that completely tracks back in i think it was what uh, the very end of november uh, Chris Sharp and Josh Boswell and myself, we 
published an article in the Daily Mail that dealt with the, the sort of technicalities of the crash retrieval program. And one of the things that we revealed for the first time was the existence of this organization within the CIA that runs under the Directorate of Science and Technology called the Office of Global Access and how there currently is a, we'll just say a, a ISR capability of detecting in real time when these crashes occur then Office of Global Access would either task the recovery effort off to JSOC or a Joint Special Operations Command, or they would task the recovery operation to a private contractor. So for instance, a Lockheed Martin, then who employs a private security contractor such as, um, oh, what's, what was the one in, 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 um, in Iraq, Bl Blackwater. But one of the things that yeah. we discovered in our research was the heavy involvement with DOE. Now we weren't, originally we thought it was a nuclear emergency uh, search team, NEST, but we sort of had indications that it was actually a, another group that had similar training in how to recover w, loose, uh, loose WMDs, anything that had to do with nuclear, but we weren't able to confirm if it was NEST or if it was actually another sort of sub-program or more secret program run out of, out of DOE. But still at the end of the day, the main thing that we understood was recovering these objects requires the same skill set from a first responder that is dealing with nuclear, biological, or, or chemical. And right. so, so, Dr. Taylor, when, when you were doing all this training with DHS regarding WMD, this was, of course, after 9-11, and understand you didn't really get involved in this topic in, until 2017. Were there any alarm bells that went off and said, hey, you know, maybe some of these folks that, that I was dealing with in DHS or DOE in terms of how to deal with loose WMDs in New York City or wherever, did that set off any alarm bells saying to yourself, you know what, maybe it's the same sort of thing or the same people mm -hmm. would also deal with that? So absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the things that I realized is that the NNSA provided a lot of the training for first responders through, I believe it's the University of Nevada, including um, doing work at the Nevada test site in terms of uh, training all, uh, public safety uh, first responders on how to identify different radioactive uh, isotopes, how to use the detection equipment. But the NNSA was, you know, they may have had a dual role in terms of dealing with uh, other items that were not prosaic in the WMD world. So DOE definitely has a connection if, as far as uh, WMD response and the training that it provided to first responders. I would imagine that that training might be similar to um, a response to a non prosaic situation. And NS, NNSA, that's what the National Nuclear Security Administration. Nuclear Security correct? Agency, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and that would actually, that would, that would make a lot of sense. For instance, I did some research a while back on NNSA, and they have a paramilitary force. Uh, it's, I mean, it is a large organization because part of how I understand it, one of their responsibilities is transporting nuclear weapons across the country. So let's say from Pantex uh, in Amarillo to whatever Minuteman squadron is up in, in Wyoming, NNSA is the one responsible for transporting these nuclear materials. They are, they are responsible for the, the security of that convoy, that sort of thing. So it would completely make sense that NNSA would be involved in that. Um, and, and, you know, and as Richard said, there is considerable evidence in, in the, in the, literature that ties all of these objects to having some sort of radiological uh, component. So uh, now, Richard, have, have you found in, in your research into this whole topic, have you found that there are, at least in some law enforcement or first responder organizations within a community, do, have you found any sort of evidence of, a, of procedures that are in a book or well, anything that, like that? Well, that's... Keith and I have talked about this extensively um, in 
Uh, and he can, I was going to say, maybe if, if you could explain, Keith recently did a survey of, you know, there's 1800 police departments and he did a survey of the biggest ones. And he'll tell you that he can explain that. But basically that's the problem is that, you know, in my, in my world, when I work for, for, for DHS, a, a big part of my responsibility was dealing with law enforcement people that respond to the airports. And so I got to know the, you know, the state police and the local police and the FBI and the ATF and the bomb squads and all that kind of stuff. There was never, you know, in my whole time there, the, the I've never heard the word UFO ever spoken about anything, you know, and, it, and the fact is, is I think that part of the stigma, like we were talking about earlier is up until the last couple of years, if you were a cop and you, you, you saw something, they're going to tell you to keep quiet about it. Because, I mean, think about it. You, you're the local sheriff. You get elected, okay? And you're not going to want anything out there that's going to embarrass you and maybe not get elected again next time, you know? And, I mean, I remember um, I have a friend that would uh, – he was with one of the sheriff's departments in the Midwest, and he was a really, really good um, investigator doing cattle mutilations. He was really distinguished in that. Well, he did an investigation, and somehow it got in the paper, and next thing you know, he got fired. Wow. You know, that was maybe 15 years, 10, 15 years ago, but it's a shame. But I think now with all the stuff that's coming out uh, in Congress and, you know, they're interviewing people on TV and stuff, the, the, I think that what really has inspired me to write my book is I was talking to one of the local sheriffs here, that one of the guys I served with during the post 9-11 period. And I went to see him and, um, and he said that, you know, he was really interested. I just wanted to chat with him because I live in his, his, his county. And he asked me what I did. And I told him about the UFO stuff. And he was like really interested. He's the guy that's read a lot of stuff and watched a lot of shows. And he's really interested. And he told me, you know, he said, we're, we don't, we're in a very rural community. He says, he said, we said something crashed or landed up in the forest there one night. We didn't really know what to do with it, what about it. And he said, well, could you come and talk to my guys about it? And, and that's what inspired me to write that book because there's such a need for it. You know, and they don't. I think now that a lot of these guys that are sheriffs and chiefs of police, they know now that this is for real. They want their people trained so that they understand what's going on. I think that, and, and that makes it, complete sense. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Taylor. Yeah, I was just going to uh, what uh, Richard alluded to was um, in 2023, June 2023, I decided to send out um, um uh, letters asking for uh, whether there were any procedures or policies, training, or um, uh, uh, any kind of uh, anything related to UAP incidents that were uh, provided to officers from any of the state police agencies or any of the uh, police departments of the five largest cities in each of the states. So it's about 300. And uh, I got a 25% response. And of course, all the responses were in the negative. Uh, and that did not surprise me. It simply confirmed what I experienced in my own career, which is that this was a subject that did not come up. And if it did, it would not be dealt with in a serious manner. Right. And from the accounts that I've seen of when officers actually did go on the record and reported publicly, uh, that they had some sort of interaction or experience, uh, the, the consequences could be significant. Everything from being fired to getting a visit from an unknown intelligence agency, uh, intimidation. Uh, and so, you know, in the, that, in the profession, once it's known what will happen, consequences, everybody else falls in line. So then... Mm -hmm. There's no, no more problems because no one reports anything. And again, there's no place to report it to. And then when we talk about uh, official uh, disinformation campaigns, which whistleblower David Grush alluded to, you can see that the, that the issue is much more complicated than simply trying to address whether or not there's a UAP um, issue. It's actually how are we going to address the concerted efforts to uh, by government to withhold information or to overclassify it so that the general public is not aware of what's actually going on. Now, I don't, 
I don't have any information about what's going on. I have no classified information. But clearly, when you have the UAP Disclosure Act written by the Senate, um, the Schumer and Rounds, that refers very specifically to NHI and UAP crashes. When you have David Gruss testifying in July of, of, of 2023, when you have the 2021 uh, initial report by the Office of the Director of Intelligence, the preliminary assessment on UAP, with that other category, which talks about objects that display unusual flight characteristics or signature management. Those are all what we call in the police world clues that there's something there, there. And so we, my whole concern, my whole mission with this effort is to bring awareness to the law enforcement and emergency management community to develop policies, training, uh, and, and equipment, detection equipment, much like what was done with the uh, Department of Homeland Security and how it dealt with, um, with uh, WMD incidents 20 years ago. Have you have you ever have you come across any sort of evidence that outside of the U.S. in Europe or or elsewhere that first responders or that there are procedures in place for first responders in dealing with this? I have not had the opportunity to look uh, in any substantial way at what other uh, other nations, other uh, parts of the world, how they're dealing with this issue. Uh, if they're taking the lead from the United States government, I would imagine that there would be a significant amount of um, of uh, stigma, stigma, and <laughs> not allowing information to be openly uh, discussed. I think of things like Virginia and other places where clearly there's a uh, some sort of governmental influence that is dictating to those in, who have seen something to not talk about it um, under significant consequences if they decide to do so. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that is that is so sad about all of this is there is clearly an extensive history from the U.S. government, most likely emanating from the CIA, this this kind of disinformation campaign that essentially operates in a way, A, in in disseminating disinformation to the American public, which is morally just completely objectionable, of course, but also imparting fear, using fear as a mechanism for people that come across these things to not talk. It's like they, they don't even care of the collateral, about the collateral damage to these people, uh, be it uh, obviously, people in our military, pilots, uh, whoever in the DoD, mm -hmm. people in the intelligence community, clearly, they were they were victims to all of this. And and thank God for Senator Gillibrand and others that have passed federal legislation to protect people. But but still, I think at the end of the day, the DoD intelligence community message to people that are officially dealing with this is to keep your mouth shut and don't talk about it. And it's it's in many ways sort of, I think, what was probably Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick's edict or, or how he operated, which was don't look into anything. If you don't look into anything, you're not going to find anything. And it, it jeopardizes our men and women in, in uniform. It jeopardizes our men and women that are first responders. It's it's frankly un-American and I don't understand it just that has to change. That's so, <laughs> total bullshit. So, uh, that is for sure. Go ahead, Matt. There's uh, something uh, that said about it's not the crime; it's the cover up. Hundred so percent. Withholding yes. Hold, withholding information of this kind of uh, nature from the American public is one thing, but the efforts, the illegal or extra legal efforts to keep that secret, is the cover up, and so. That is why we're in such a quandary as, as a nation, because uh, there are those who simply won't accept that this is the reality we live in. But then there are those that are um, working hard to make sure that nothing changes. It's, and it's, we saw that with, yeah. with the UAPDA, for, for instance. 
Yeah, for sure. If, hopefully, if, if there's round two of this, they'll be able to keep uh, right uh, Republican uh, Representative Mike Turner's dirty little uh, uh, hands off of the thing. So maybe it'll, really? maybe we'll have another version. I I certainly hope so. But yeah, I I think in general that that is the whole issue with this is all of this is being run in a, a legal fashion. Clearly, it's been hidden from Congress illegally, uh, and essentially you have an intelligence an intelligence and military apparatus that has been behaving essentially like a military junta, deciding on their own that our elected officials don't need to know about this when, oh, by the way, they work for us. But you can't have a functioning democracy if you're jeopardizing the, the well-being and safety of our men and women in uniform, the well-being and, uh, and safety of our first responders, and really the well-being and safety of the general public. Burying your head in the sand and lying about it uh, on a consistent basis to the American public, it's un-American and it just a democracy can't survive that way. So something has got to change. But I also think, uh, Keith, what you were talking about earlier, so much of this, it's it's not the lie, it's the cover up that is, it continues to rot in the refrigerator, as I think Lou Elizondo once pointed out, and it's going to continue to rot. But my guess is that there are a lot of people in CIA, DOD, elsewhere that know that when all of the dirty laundry comes out, there could be a lot of people that will likely end up going to jail. And in my opinion, exactly. there, there are some that should be. I do think that there needs to be some sort of reconciliation process. And what I would say to our lawmakers and people in the DOD and IC that are watching this that may not necessarily be on the side of dis disclosure is the American public, and I think the world in general, can be very forgiving. If you go up and you say, you know what, 80 years, we made a really, a really stupid mistake to cover this up. We should have been transparent with the American public. We, we did it for what we thought were the right reasons, and it just kind of spun out of control. If, if you just come clean with the American public, and that's really all I feel comfortable in addressing, I think that they would find that the public is very forgiving and the path to reconciliation would be very short and and be wrought with with the lesser amount of consequences but the more they continue to do the same stuff covering covering it up lying to the public lying to congress about it uh, illegally hiding this it's 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 just going to make the process even harder when it finally happens and i guarantee you folks it will end up happening yes. it is unavoidable this will come out there will be a a yep. mass public awareness of this and people are going to be pissed the longer you continue to hide this anyway enough of my rant there now now richard I, we i was ahead, just please. going to say something about that too is like what, what keith was saying the criminal activity but there's another aspect to this is like there's an incredible amount of money that's been made by these these defense contractors. And we can even see that way back in the Eisenhower administration when they had people, you know, Corso and some of these people, they're gathering this crash wreckage up and they're giving it to these technology companies. And they made deals with them where they could have patent rights on on what they developed and, and they could make a lot of money on it as long as they kept it. For, for the, you know, military applications. So when you look at some of these companies, they've made trillions of dollars on this, which is one of the reasons why they're not in any hurry to hand it over. That's right. Because they, they, it's it's the financial thing. And then, like you said, there's the criminal part of it, too. You know, I... Um, it, 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 when when this all comes to light, you're going to have all kinds of problems with taxes that haven't been paid and, and people have been murdered and all kinds of stuff that's going to come out. And these guys aren't in any hurry to face the music. And that's why they're going to fight it as hard as they can. Yeah, I, I totally well, agree. I uh, Go ahead, uh, please. Uh, no, I, I, I was just going to mention, I just have to add this because I think it really cuts at the argument of where's the proof um, there's a recent book that came out, I think, last year, Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Programs, Initial Revelations, James Wataski, uh, Dr. Wataski, Colin Kelleher, and George Knapp. Yeah. And Dr. Lukaski, who was a program manager for the Defense Intelligence Agency, he ran OSAP, said, and certainly in a recent interview, uh, but also in his book, 
uh, that he went into a craft, a UAP craft. That should end discussion about is it possible that there's life in the universe? And I also want to say uh, to my friend uh, here, the Richard, that uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lacassie also said that Mr. Lang and his investigators contributed greatly to the success of OSAP operations. Wow. So, although Richard won't uh, do that, it's in the book. That's awesome. So, no, that um, that was um, that was really gracious of them to do that, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Yeah, I, as I always say, this whole thing, it's it is a a truly a team effort. All of us have a part to play. It's not just down to a few people. Everyone has a part to play uh, a part to play in this. Now, going back Richard and and talking about what you were what you were referring to in terms of the illegalities of it and the the power that these corporations have and the lack of accountability that these folks have and i think a lot of that is by design by the cia who yep. what we were told is they are the portfolio manager for yes. the entire ua uap topic I referred earlier to the article that Chris Sharp, Josh Boswell, and myself did for the Daily Mail at the end of November. And one of the things, and again, this was dealing with how the crash recovery, the CR program is run out of CIA under the Directorate of Science and Technology, and that it part of part of how that works is they detect one of these things going down. It's then tasked to JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. So, so JSOC, they are in charge of all of our Tier 1 operators. So Navy SEAL, Army, Green Beret, I don't know all of the details, but, but that is what they do. Now, one of the interesting things that we found out, which again goes back to what Eisenhower was speaking about, I think, in terms of the military-industrial yes. complex, one of the things that, that we were told by multiple sources is the recovery operations are divvied up either to JSOC, where you they send in tier one operators with, with whatever outfit in the DOE is, is running these ops, uh, in addition to Navy SEALs or, or whatever tier one operators are sending in. But then there are also crash crashes that are detected that are sent strictly to the private contractor to go in, send their team in and recover. Now, one of the things that we were not able to find out, and we, and believe me, we asked about this, is what was what is the what is the decision making ladder like? How do they determine what a what a a military outfit uh, such as uh, JSOC or or Navy SEALs? What is going to get tasked to JSOC in terms of recovering the vehicle? And then what is going to be sent directly to the private contractor, aerospace contractor, uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, whoever, to go and pull these things up? So then you sit and you ask yourself, well, who is making that decision? And who is who is providing oversight to that? And how is that even legal? That's what I that's what I wonder i mean i could i could see the case for instance that that giving these recovery operations to jsoc that would fall under the pur purview of our military or, in, or intelligence agency but agencies but then to go and say to a private contractor you guys go pick this up i i and congress isn't told about it the gang of eight isn't told about it, it well, i mean now they all know but it, it just goes back to the whole thing. How is this legal? And at some point, they have to come clean about this. Well, the bottom line is it's obviously not legal. One of the things I would I'd like to say to you personally is that the article that you guys wrote about the CIA was one of the the coolest things I've ever read. That I saw your interviews and your videos, and I was like, thank God these guys did this because we've always known a lot about that, but that that article really sort of like confirmed a lot of the things that a lot of people in my world were worried about for a long time. And I, you guys, that I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. And Thank I you. even referenced it in my book. I went back and revised my book and put that in the book to make sure that we, we caught that because it came out right about the time the book was published. But the bottom line is, is I think that, you know, in, in, in my history lesson, 
the the way this evolved is is just that is the government like people say to, today they'll go well, why doesn't the government just tell us what's what they have with all these UFOs and stuff well the problem is they don't have it anymore the the private contractors all have it the, this stuff isn't laying around in some air force base it's it's in the in the you know at Lockheed Martin and the dozens of other when I worked for Bigelow after the project ended someone had filed a Freedom of Information Act request about uh, brash wreckage at, at Bigelow. And the facility they had there was, uh, that that was a classified facility. And they had an underground facility that was built and designed to, 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 to maintain highly classified stuff. And there was a Freedom of Information Act request that was answered by the Pentagon. And they said that the Big, that Bigelow Aerospace had extraterrestrial crash recovery in their facility there. That, that was stated by the Pentagon? Yeah, it was on a Freedom of Information Act request. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I did not know about that at the time. If I would have known, I'd have been over there on my hands and knees begging those guys to let me work <laughs> right. on that side of the project. But sure. that's not what happened. And and again, in my world, the, what I was working on was non-classified. And then on the, I usually say it was like on the other side of the mirror, you know, was where they were, were doing all that stuff. But I think that a lot of that, um, what you said is something I was up in your articles. That's what I've always believed. The CIA is behind it and handled it. Um, and they're the primary, they're the primary players as far as the covering the stuff up. And, um, it just like you said, is they're, they're like the portfolio manager. When something comes down, they, they decide who's going to pick it up, where it's going to go and which defense contractor is going to get it. And, and, and I think they've been doing that for a long time. Oh, yeah. No, they've, they've definitely been doing that a long time. And then also in terms of the illegality as well, and I know we're kind of getting slightly off topic with, with the first yeah. responder stuff, but, but but we're having such a great conversation here. Right. Is one of the other things that we found out is the people that have been responsible for the wet works, the kinetic retaliation against people in the program ready to spill information about the program. This was all run by a rogue group of operators in JSOC. A, and that was kind of all we were able to get. And one of the things that, and firstly, thank you for the compliment about the article. And it, it was truly a team effort. And one of the things that I want awesome. to really emphasize is we vetted this extensively. We Chris Sharp had, had begun work on this months prior and he had spoken to me about it and said you know what i think i've figured out how all of this has been run of course everyone knew something had been going on but in terms of of how organizationally it would be structured he was the one that really through kind of open source methods figured out what the how the puzzle worked and then then when i came on board i started running things through my sources and in uh, throughout government we'll just say that and then Josh Boswell uh, came aboard and you and ran everything through his sources but we vetted this to the nth degree because we we didn't want to put out anything that could be false we wanted to be 100 percent right. certain in the accuracy of what what we put out and all I all I will say and of course our sources will never leave our lips these are probably some of the most vetted sources with the highest security clearances that you could possibly have working for the United States government. These weren't people, you know, that heard something from a bro. These were people that worked uh, worked in there. So anyway, I, I digress. But but I, I do think it, it is a it comes back to the whole issue of do we want a military industrial complex telling us how our democracy needs to operate and calling the shots. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Now, Richard, a, a question for you. We have seen a, a push. What Really, this is for both of you. We've seen a, a recent push on a focus for public safety for our aviators. So we have a former Navy pilot, Ryan mm -hmm. Graves, and his organization, Americans for Safe Aerospace, who we hope to have on sometime soon. But really, where they're coming from, which is a completely valid point, is this stuff is floating around in our skies. It is a danger to not only our military air crews, but also to our, our, our commercial aviation. If these things are flying around and, and our commercial pilots 
they are hesitant to go and report this and much the same reasons of, of what you were talking about with law enforcement, local law enforcement being encouraged not to speak about this. So now he's gone, th he's come through his proposed legislation that, that hopefully will uh, make its way into federal law that will protect commercial pilots and establish a, a reporting mechanism. But there, there is a new emphasis, at least in the aviation sector, to address public safety. To both of you, do you see that occurring at the public level on the ground in terms of the uh, police, fire, whatever? Do you think that there will be a focus on that for all of us that are on the ground rather than just people up on the air, in the air? Well, I, I can say that, um, you know, in aviation, um, the, the, there's always been these things occur a lot more than the average person realizes. Just in the, the program I worked on, there's 800 reports that come in every month, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, they say only one in 450 people that see something like that will ever report it. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But back in the day, the airline industry was like really, it's like what Keith said with law enforcement, pilots were like super discouraged from reporting this because the airline executives didn't want people to get scared and be afraid to fly. So if you reported something, they would run you through the ringer. You know, they take you off duty, you'd have to go talk to the company psych, and they'd try to make you feel like you were crazy or something like that. And like Keith said, after a while, guys, you know, they know the drill, they know, so they know to just keep their mouth shut. But um, we, the, Keith, maybe you could elaborate too on that, the legislation that's been going on recently. Yeah, yeah please do. Uh, I, th I, I think that uh, um, Lieutenant uh, Graves' work is, uh, it's really important because it can set a standard, uh, but we don't need it just for commercial pilots and military pilots. We need a homeland security equivalent that allows uh, public safety professionals to report to a governmental agency that will treat their uh, their their report with the seriousness that it deserves. This will allow scientists to understand a little better the frequency of these types of situations, the types and kinds of incidents or craft that are seen or encounters that are or had, we don't have an idea. We don't know what we don't know. So we're really at a deficit. We don't even know how to compare the past to the present in terms of numbers because there hasn't been a reliable way to do so. And for those very compelling incidents, I'm certain that they were most likely classified. So we, you know, we're at a, a distinct disadvantage. Nothing uh, to see so, here. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the legislation is... Uh, is it's it's very important and hopefully we can get versions of that for public safety professionals and also yeah. with the legislation they're saying that they put um wording in there that basically the airlines can't punish someone for reporting something which is huge yeah that that is absolutely huge and you would think it would go without saying but as they say, the no. money the money makes the world go around, and it seems that at the end of the day, be it uh, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, or uh, or your airline, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. It's not your not your personnel, your people. It's uh, yeah, it's it's just an it's ah. <laughs> don't get me started now now Keith. So as a NYPD officer, you I would imagine in the course of of your career, you've really seen how should I put this, the sort of dregs of society. You've seen the worst of, of man, the worst of how we treat each other and, and the things that we do. Do you think as a society that society in general will be able to handle this in a constructive way? Or do you think the shit will hit the fan and people will be looting and all that kind of stuff? Uh, I think that it depends on our response. It's up to us on how we decide to handle this information. If uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, effort to deny what is being revealed, then there will probably be more uh, ontological shock, which is a word that's used a lot, but a, a lot of uh, unnecessary confusion and uh, conflict and anxiety. This, remember, is not a national issue it is a global one 
So mm -hmm. we may not be the first country to actually state this is what's happening and this is the history of it and this is the evidence that we've had. And there may be another country that decides that uh, they're not going to um, withhold that anymore. I'm thinking about Canada's most recently with the announcement from their, uh, I think, science representative that they are going to make more information available. Um, so those who have been looking at this for years, I'm thinking of the researchers like the Stanton Friedmans and the Stringfields and all these amazing uh, researchers who um, uh, I've tried hard to, uh, to get up to speed with. They, they all indicate that this is not a question of if, it's just a question of when it will be released to the public. And, so, and, the, and yeah. the other thing you have to consider too, and Richard, I would love to get your take on this, but I would imagine that it's one thing like if Canada goes first, of course there's gonna be egg on on the face of the American government. People are gonna ask, why didn't you tell us about this? Why didn't you warn our family that something could show up in the bedroom that you cannot control? That's gonna be bad enough, but when you think about a an adversarial nation such as China or Russia deciding to go first, and there was considerable discussion about this when I was at the Seoul Conference at Stanford University, Richard, what do you think about that? I mean, that it's it's a recipe for not good things for the for the American government in terms of trusting their trustworthiness. Well, I think that's some of the pressure that's on Congress right now is because there, there's always the possibility that some other nation will step in front of you and basically, um, you know, blow your cover. But I think that. Um, there, there's another element to this. I talked about a lot about in my books is the high strangeness that's involved. Um, when you're dealing with, uh, you, you know, uh, there was this back in the 1938, I think Orson Welles did a show one night. It was called World of the Worlds. And they basically um, pretended like there was a Martian invasion, you know. And they talked about this one landed in New York. And now, you know, they, they kept interrupting the, the show. Oh, now one landed in, you know, in um, New Jersey. And they kind of got this frenzy going. And these people just like freaked out, man. The, the, um, the police in New York came to the studio at CBS and tried to stop the show because wow. there was just so much panic. The people were calling the police departments and people were jumping in their cars and trying to get out of town. And there was people were driving up the wrong side of the interstates and stuff. That's how crazy it got, you know, and it, and it was, uh, it was on Halloween. Of so, course. <laughs> you, of course they did that. But, you know, I mean, I think that if, if we come to a point in disclosure, there's so many things, like I talked about this in my book, that some of the high strangeness, it has to be, you can't just dump it on the public all at once because you realize that you're dealing with, with interdimensional, you know, exist vehicles and entities that can travel interdimensionally. They can manipulate time and um, all the, the really crazy things that we see in these reports. Um, it, you're going to have to be careful about how you lay that out for the public. It, it, it you have to educate them, you know, a little one step at a time. And I think for the most part, that might be part of what's going on with the whole disclosure thing. They're trying to, you know, I you, you couldn't get on 60 Minutes and go, okay, well, you know, first of all, the government's told us that, that these UFOs are all real and they're piloted by extraterrestrials that come from other planets and, you know, they can read your mind and they can manipulate time and, you know, they can snatch you out of your bedroom and, you know, abduct you in a national forest. And they're not going to, you, you just couldn't do something like that because it would just drive everybody crazy. You know, they, they'd just be in panic mode. So I think with the, the high strangeness that that element has to be very carefully disclosed through education and, you know, over a period of time, it won't be easy. It definitely won't be easy. When I when I was at Seoul, I had a had a conversation with uh, former Assistant Undersecretary of Defense uh, Christopher Mellon. So, sort of yeah. my my story is, I had never had anything happen my entire life. Never seen a thing. Never nothing weird. 
And when I decided to start covering this and had a conversation with a particular senator's national security staff where they said, yeah, this is all really going on. Uh, yeah, there are mm -hmm. China and Russia things, but we're not talking about China and Russia. We're talking about something coming in from from elsewhere that is that is not human. Probably about a day or so later, we started having weird paranormal stuff happen in the house. We had my wife's driver's license got moved into the dryer and she hadn't done done laundry in a week. And and we had a dog gate that got pushed over in the middle of the night. We had that on video. I mean, it was some really weird stuff. And then about five days later is when the orb showed up about above the house. But the the paranormal stuff con continued for about six months. It was not fun. It was rattling and especially again coming from the lens of never having any of this stuff ever happen to either my wife or I and then all of a sudden this stuff is going on at one point my wife had finally said look maybe you need to stop looking into this UFO stuff so all of this stops and you know the, the dog was barking at stuff growling at stuff I mean, it was really disturbing and the only thing that I could figure out now, backing up a little bit, in addition to speaking to this senator's office, right around the same time, I also began having extended discussions with researcher Robert Hastings, the author of, of UFOs and Nukes. Now, Robert is an experiencer. He speaks about that, uh, uh, has spoken about that publicly, or at least in his, in his book. And when I, when I told him about this, I, when all this stuff started happening, I gave a shout to Gary Nolan and some other people saying, hey, this all this stuff just boom out of the blue started happening. Everybody came back and, and said, well, it, it is probably the hitchhiker effect. And anyway, when it, right. when, a little bit long winded here, but when I was talking to Christopher Mellon about it, I one of the things that had always sort of crossed my mind was if it's not the hitchhiker effect, let's just say it was the fact that I was mentally engaging with this topic on a consistent level that precipitated this stuff to start happening. The, the, the paranormal stuff, which I had never had any idea prior to getting involved with this, that there was any sort of co-location of it. But, but my question to Mellon was, so what happens if the president goes up in, 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 at the White House in front of a podium and says to the entire American people, this stuff is real, we can't do anything about it. And then all of a sudden, this stuff starts engaging with Americans right above their homes like it did with me. <clears throat> how you would mitigate, A, number one, how would the president or whoever's going to dump this warn the American public that this is a possibility, that what happened to me could end up happening, uh, happening to average Americans? And then how would the, how would the American public handle that? And, you know, and maybe this is for you, Keith, how, how is it better to just level with everybody and to mitigate mass panic that our first responders would have to deal with if a one, one of the things that Carl Nell spoke about, which is a, a catastrophic disclosure where this NHI decides to start appearing with people. Do you think in your experience, uh, Keith, with the general public that it will be better handled if they are warned about this in incremental steps, that it's laid out in incremental steps, as Richard just spoke about. Is that the way to go to mitigate the <clears throat> risks to, for public order? Yes, I think you have to meet people where they are. And some folks are in a lot of denial uh, about this subject. Uh, some folks are, 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 you know, very happy that this is becoming uh, that it's becoming known and better accepted by the general public. Uh, the care has to be taken because of the way that experiencers have been treated. Um, I, I work with UAP Med. UAP Med is the organization Ted Rowe that works uh, on getting the mental health community, the professionals. Uh, on board with understanding that the DSM-5 may need to be updated to reflect the reality on the ground. Uh, I, there's a white paper that I work with my with colleagues there uh, talking about how to how we should go about getting policies, procedures, and uh, protocols in place for first responders and the mental health 
community and other stakeholders to prepare for this and be able to uh, treat people in, in a appropriate way because they're not given the tools to do so from the point that the phone call comes in to the point to, to the consequences to the individual for, you know, after they make the call, everything from ridicule to loss of employment, et cetera, uh, being told that they have to get psychiatric evaluation before they can uh, fly their, their, their plane commercially again. There are all kinds of uh, um, systemic and historic problems that are going to have to be addressed. Uh, but we, as a country, I, I feel very confident that we can do so in a rational way. We just have to get beyond the stigma as well as whatever disinformation campaigns have been conducted over the many years that people have been reporting these types of incidents. So that's that's why I'm here. And, and I just want to mention that there, there are folks in various disciplines that are stepping to the plate. I think of Admiral, Admiral Gallaudet, who's uh, you know got an incredible Dr. Nolan, which was mentioned earlier. All these folks in different fields that are uh, very serious people that are stating this is something that we have to deal with now. And so I clearly see my role as uh, lending my, whatever credibility I have as a public safety professional to asking those in power, those in authority, any of the congressional leaders or other individuals that may be listening to act on this and not continue the same kinds of uh, behaviors that have resulted in us being in a very difficult situation as a country. It, uh, it is. Yeah, I, I agree. It is a difficult situation. And, and here's kind of a, uh, an anal and a, um, oh, I can't think of the word, uh, but, but if, if you were, let's say Keith, you were the chief of police for a neighborhood and you were aware of a, a burglar that was, had been running around breaking into homes. Would you, would you warn the public about the existence of this burglar or whoever breaking into homes or would you keep it quiet and not let the public know the public deserves the truth uh, unabashedly without fear or favor they deserve the truth and so if there is a threat they need to know about it and not have them think that they're imagining things or being told that what they saw was some sort of uh, seagull or a balloon in the sky or whatever excuse right. is, you know, the same excuse today as the ones that were used 50 years ago. I think of a recent speech I heard uh, uh, with an uh, interview with, uh, with Wallace and um, Major Kehoe, Donald Kehoe, and the very same lines of reasoning that were being given to Kehoe are the same things that are being given today. We need to step beyond that loop and deal with reality as it exists today. And all you only have to do is listen to those military pilots that are stating that this exists or read the reports that have been done by uh, governmental agencies acknowledging this or the legislation by uh, Schumer and Rounds that state that UAP and NHI are real and as a country we need to to have some laws around uh, procedures and processes uh, around how this is dealt with and the wild wild west phenomenon and can can i make a comment on that too i Please. was just thinking about <clears throat> when i was talking before about how that that we have to incrementally introduce the public to these things I didn't mean to convey that I think it's a threat. It's just strange and it's hard to understand. On of, of all the work that I've done and in interviews I've done with people that have had ET contact, I do not believe that they're um I do not believe they're a threat to us. Okay. Um I think that uh what what you're dealing with is you're dealing with multi-dimensional 
aspects and much higher levels of human consciousness than most of the public is used to dealing with. But I don't necessarily want to convey that it's a threat. You were talking about Chris Mellon earlier, and he I'm not quoting him exact, but it's in my quoted in my book. But basically what he said was that when this all comes out, you're going to see unbelievable innovations in um, transportation, in free energy production and medical innovations. When it comes out, it's going to be very if it comes out as a catastrophic event, it's going to be very traumatic for the public initially. But in the long term, it'll be a great benefit to humanity. And I, I I think that I think that is so. So when when I'm when I'm saying this is I think that what you have is that you know part of the problem with the I've, I've always said the defense contractors are more of a threat to us than the ETs are. Um, hopefully, I won't you know find my house burned down when I get home or anything. But, um, <laughs> yeah. The the um the the innovations in the the money that's been made. These guys are, have developed technology that's that's 100 years ahead of anything that we have. Um, free energy production, um, the um, transportation innovations, anti-gravity transportation, and, and a lot of medical innovations that, that have not been shared with the public. So that I think that once, if, if it happens where we do have a connection where the ETs show themselves to us, so that the average person has some access to that higher level of, you know, in, intelligence or that level of what I'm saying is that contact with ETs will cause a, a, a dramatic rise in human consciousness and awareness. And a lot of the things that are going on right now in the world, just like with the CIA covering this up, the defense contractors hiding all this stuff, people, as they evolve in higher levels of consciousness, they're not going to allow that anymore. You know, it's the old story that we are many, ye are few, you know, mm -hmm. and you've got a, a fairly handful of people controlling the rest of us. And if once we get to higher levels of consciousness, that's not going to be so easy to do. And that might ultimately be part of the agenda on their side is that they don't want these people that develop those higher levels of consciousness because then it's going to put them out of business, you know. Yeah. So that's in my, yeah. my thought, it's there's hope there and, and that – um, so somebody that, that we interviewed and, and I can't prove this true or not, but they were basically saying that, that we were involved with the, the government's got a couple of ET, uh, races that they're involved with and that, that their, their biggest agenda is eradicating nuclear weapons on, on, on earth. And when I say that everybody goes, well, that's a great idea. I'd go for that. And so would I. But if that happened, then they're going to show themselves and then we're going to all be trying to connect with them consciously. And I think that we'll evolve in, a, in, in that way. So the, like with the interdimensional stuff in the, um, you know, higher levels of consciousness um, all, and, and all those things are hard to deal with. But I don't think they're a threat. I just think it's a, a matter of learning, you know, what how it works. I, I agree. And I, I certainly hope it's not a threat uh, for sure. But I think my larger point is it should be the choice should be given to Amer average Americans, Americans, or just all of us in the human race. We should be given this information or at the very least told that we are not the, you know, the top of the food chain. And then people for themselves armed with that knowledge, decide for themselves how this affects, uh, affects them, if it affects them. It was funny, after uh, on my cab ride back uh, to L.A. from uh, uh, to the airport, uh, going back to L.A. from the Seoul Conference, it was like five in the morning and the Uber driver was driving me to, to San Francisco. And he was a young guy, probably in his mid-20s. And I, I said to him, what, what if I told you that I had knowledge that UFOs are real and that we are being interacted with by non-human intelligence. And I, I told him a little bit about the conf about what had occurred at the conference. And he thought for a second and he goes, you know what? I've always figured this was real. I know we're not alone in the universe, but you know what? At the end of the day, I'm having a hell of a time putting food on my table. I'm having to drive Uber to make ends meet for my family. And I'm really kind of focused on that. And, and it really just kind of brought home to me that I think that 
there will be a large portion of the population that will view it as that. They're not going to be surprised. And, and at the end of the day, they, as long as they can put food on the table, go to their kids' soccer games, this may not be as impactful as a lot of us fear it may be. Now, can't say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, of course, but, but I do think that a lot of, at least here in America, a lot of people have their just challenges making life work, be it financially or, or whatever. So, but at the end of the day, I think that if people are just told if they just level with the American, American people about what has been going on in the long run, that will be the best for the government. It'll be best for the country. It'll be best for the national security. And it certainly will be best for, for social uh, stability. Now, now, Richard, after your book came out, have you, what, what kind of feedback did you get from first responders for? Well, that, any, the, the book just came out and that's what uh, we're doing right now is we're sending it out to these sheriff's departments and stuff like that. And I'm trying to contact them. Um, you know, Keith and I have talked about that and basically put together a little training presentation. So if I can go see a local sheriff, talk to his guys for an hour, and then here's the book, bring them up to speed, that kind of thing. But that's that's where we're at. Is we just, I mean, the book just came out a couple of weeks ago. Got it. And, okay. Um, that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to push it out there and, um, you know, get, get the – I think everybody that's looked at the book and, and especially people like Keith that have high qualifications, I mean, um, he's done nothing but give me really positive uh, feedback on my book. Um, and coming from him, it's a it's a big deal because he's he's been involved in a lot of this stuff, you know. Understood. Keith, what, what would your message be to law enforcement first responders would you walk in and say, hey, everyone read this book? What What is the best way to move the ball forward in terms of the people that, that manage our first responders and making sure that they have the tools available, both in just knowledge or physical tools available to deal with all of this? How? What is the best way to move that forward? Uh, certainly, uh, Richard's book is, is an important book. Uh, uh, first step, also looking at uh, organizations like UAP Med and so many UAP Caucus webpage to get familiar with, uh, you know, what the current discussion is about this issue. Look at the legislation, the, the UAPDA. I cannot emphasize enough how important that is in just understanding what uh, the legislators who are obviously informed about this phenomenon, what they are concerned about, and also demand more from their uh, political leaders that this is not just a national security issue, it is a homeland security issue. Uh, it's not just military that deals with it. It has historically been uh, local public safety professionals as well. I wish I knew to what extent. It's not 1,800 law enforcement agencies, it's 18,000. But you know, that's quite right. But clearly, uh, we don't know what we don't know. So we need to address that. We need to uh, start utilizing common sense uh, methods of dealing with this as an issue and not as some sort of, um, what are the words that are used to describe it? Um, some sort of strange, outrageous kind of um, uh, thing not to be taken seriously. So fringe, that's the word that I was looking for. But this is not a fringe subject at all. And uh, for all those, go ahead. No, no, please. <clears throat> so for all those folks that are putting their reputations on the line to tell the truth to the American public, I, I salute them and I thank them for helping me understand a little better um, how serious an issue this is. Richard, you go in and you you are are given a meeting with the chief of police of of we'll just say like New York or Los Angeles, and first thing out of the, his or her mouth uh, they say is you know what I've got rising crime I've got gun violence I've got all these different things why should we give your topic the time of day with all the other things that I'm fighting as a police chief? Well, I think that a lot of that would be the 
that yeah, going to a big city like New York, probably they're not that much they're not that worried about something landing in somebody's pasture. I think the more the the rural guys are a good place to start because they're the ones that are out and you know, they're seeing things at night that happen. And I don't know that people that are in the close confines of the city really are 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 seeing the the UFO activity like you would if you were out more in the, you know, in the um in the country. But the, the, I think part of it has to be driven by the fact that, you know, these guys it, in, in my experience, in my orbit here, you know, just in my, my business and in, in the, the town I live in, you know, I've had a, a, a number of uh, encounters with people like maybe some, some people from the university. Like I had a conversation with a law professor the other night and she's like totally clueless. She had no I I just started telling her about my books and what's going on. And she was like fascinated, but she goes, I had no idea that any of this was happening. I just had no and and I had a chance to spend some time with one of the major like news network anchors about a month ago. I'm not gonna say who it was, but we spent a couple hours together and I was telling him about it and the same thing. He was like totally he had no idea. I mean, he was like really cool, and 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 I think he believed me what I was telling him, but um, he he just had no no. This is somebody that's on TV every night, and and he had no idea about the UFO thing, and and um, he was really interested in it, but but totally clueless about it. So in his world and his orbit, that never comes up. So it it tells me that you know once that the the whole thing is is when the public awareness starts to build then the guys in the police departments are going to want, they're going to pay attention to it more. But I think it would be more of a, th I can't see like in an environment like New York city, where the UAP thing is that big of a threat where out well, in a rural community, there's a lot more exposure to that kind of stuff. That makes sense. Well, Richard, I would just say um, if we had, the ability for people to call 911 and then have that recorded on a public database that's successful, then both you and I would know the answer. And Matt, everyone would know the answer to the frequency of incidents occurring. And we don't know that because we don't have the, the infrastructure in place. That's why it's so important for our political leaders to respond in a rational, appropriate way. Totally, totally agree. Yeah. I, and, and sometimes yeah. I, I t sometimes I, I am pretty well convinced that the lack of these reporting mechanisms is by design. If they're not there, that means yeah. that the general public will not have access to these things and maybe or, or access to that information. And then perhaps then the general public will not have a general awareness as far as how extensive all of this is. So much in what I would say about Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick probably didn't want to know about any of this. I had lots of uh, uh, folks uh, in, tell us that when they interacted with Arrow, it was like they were just going through the motions. They didn't want to know about it. They didn't want any particular details. Uh, so if, if, if you are that organization that is supposed to be dealing with this and you aren't receptive to people coming and telling you about things, at the end of the day, you can say, well, there's nothing to see here because you know what? You didn't look and you didn't look on purpose. And uh, that, that's, just a, that's just a travesty. Uh, so Keith, what is your prediction as far as what we may see in 2024 outside of just the first responder aspect of this in terms of well, the UAP issue? Yeah, so I, uh, I, what has been going around in the you know, social media is about the, if we don't go through the easy way, we're gonna go the hard way. And the easy way would have been the UAP Disclosure Act to have some sort of controlled disclosure plan. Since that's not happening currently, there will probably be other uh, ways in which this information is gotten out to the general public. I'm, I, for one, am looking forward to Lou Elizondo's book to, um, if it's not slow walked through the Dopser process, the same thing with David Grush's op-ed, which is highly anticipated, yes. uh, James Fox's movie, the program. There are so many different things that I'm not aware of that I'm just trying to keep track of that may really um, help 
bring some level of enlightenment to the general public as to uh, the uh, the nature of what we are dealing with. Um, so uh, there there will be uh, quite quite a bit of um, I think uh, activity this year. I'm certainly hopeful, and also the hearings, the congressional hearings that I heard recently. Uh, that Representative Burchett said that uh, Speaker Johnson gave the green light to. So that may also provide additional opportunities for the general public to become aware of the significance of, of this issue. So, um, and hey, it was just one thing, I, I, you know, the, the UFO community has been beset by all kinds of issues besides government disinformation. There have been plenty of charlatans. There have been plenty of folks with mental health crisis that have helped to muddy the waters uh, around understanding this, this, uh, this issue. But that is changing rapidly by the folks that are, are, are getting involved in this and treating it appropriately. The Soul Foundation is an example. There are plenty of other examples, which are too numerous for me to, to mention today, but folks are, are working hard to get this, uh, this subject in, in the public domain, so that people are talking about it, not in a disparaging way, but in a serious and inquisitive manner. Richard, what would you say to somebody that says, you know what, I read this thing from this uh, journalist, uh, Stephen Greenstreet, and heard this from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, that this whole UAP topic is essentially a, a group of UFO enthusiasts that have managed to convince congressional staffers that all of this is real and they're chasing a bunch of spooky stories, as Green Street likes to say. And, and now, uh, clearly, Sean Kirkpatrick, who used to run Arrow, is spouting the same clown car of, of uh, BS information. What would, you, what would you say to an individual that said, hey, I, I heard all of this is just a bunch of bunk? Well, actually, I hear that people say that to me a lot. And, and you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, well, do you really believe in all that UFO stuff? And I said, well, you can say you don't believe in the Washington Monument. But if you drive down there in D.C. on Constitution Avenue, it's on the right side. It's this big thing sticking up out of the ground. And they kind of look at you. It's sarcastic. But the bottom line is, is like there is so much. There is so much information out there. I'm most encouraged. A couple of things. One is the article that I have to tell you, that article you guys wrote made my day. I love that because I really think it just like laid it out the truth. Even all the years, you know, that going back, even when the uh, Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they had an encounter with a, a UAP and um, uh, Armstrong later said that it was common knowledge at NASA, but the CIA covered it up, Yep, you know. And um, well, I think that, that that there's so much encouragement in, in Congress. And it's like you said, is it going to be catastrophic or is it going to be controlled disclosure? But you see these people like, you know, Brichette and, and um, AOC, who's like total opposite ends of the spectrum. And they're both ganging up on these guys from the Pentagon, beating them up. And like, you have no right to disclose, withhold this information from us, you know. And I think Brichette said something like, they had gone somewhere to see one of the bases and they were going to interview some pilots and stuff like that. And some four star general came out and basically said, no, you're not. You're, you don't have a high enough security clearance. And Brichette said, when we got back, we were talking about the fact maybe that security clearance is a problem. But we do have control of the budget that controls his paycheck, you know. Oh, yeah. And if I was him, I would have shut it off. But um, and then we could come back and talk about what I'm allowed to see and not see, you know. But I think there's just like this incredible power that's going on in Congress. The inspector general had that classified briefing. It was like about a week and a half ago. And I think there was like around 25 members of Congress involved in it. And they're all coming out. They're going, you know, they, they basically couldn't talk about the classified information that was given to them. But they all were saying that, that uh, you know, uh, Gresh's testimony was all validated and that, you know, they were like amazed at all the stuff that's being told to them. Well, you tell 25 congressmen the truth about stuff like that. You know, they're about as good at keeping secrets as, you know, <laughs> all right. you know what I'm saying? Give them yeah. three months and it'll be all over. Them. It'll it'll be leaked everywhere, you know. Yeah. 
So I, I really think that it's just like, you know, it's, it's like a big can of worms. And once you take the lid off it, you're not going to put the lid back on it again. And that, and I'm just very encouraged. I just think it's going to boil over soon. Well, I, I, that my optimism is measured. It's guarded because one thing that we haven't spoken about is the difference between skepticism and debunkers. And there's a and big difference. Recently had, you'd recently had Robert Heavenly, big fan of him and his partner, working hard to uncover how even something as mundane, mundane as Wikipedia could be utilized to um, skewer the general public with ideas that are false, that are basically uh, represented by debunkers trying to influence the general public's uh, uh, thinking about this issue. And it's not just that, it's uh, you know books that are written by well-regarded authors that are in a, essentially just debunk, debunking. We don't, we need less debunking where folks are, they're set in their beliefs and they are not willing to accept any information that may be contrary to it because it challenges their belief system, their worldview. We need to deal with skeptics like uh, scientists that will not believe anything, but will pursue uh, new information and, and try to find out new information about a subject which uh, really deserves it, uh, such as this. So, uh, we need more skeptics out there, and we need to stop calling uh, debunkers skeptics for those who make a, a, a living at uh, trying to debunk UAP incidents. Let's let's work on actually uh, contributing to uh, the discussion instead of just trying to uh, distract or divert away from it. Yeah. I, well, the, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, you know, the, the dark side's desperate. If they're going into Wikipedia and taking, re, re, you know, revamping someone's credentials and taking away their PhDs and their certifications, they're pretty desperate. If they're that, you know, that's that's pretty well organized. Like serious money's being spent to to do something like that, you know. No, I, I completely, I completely agree. Uh, sorry, uh, Keith, you were going to say. Yeah, and I was just going to say so, something like as simple as uh, the state you were born in. There's, you know, Lou Elizondo is well known in the UFO community. Yet Wikipedia refuses to correct an obviously incorrect newspaper article, which sources that as being his birthplace in Florida when it's actually Texas, and his attempts to correct it have not uh, gone well. And so when you have that kind of, uh, of uh, interference, noise, white noise, that sort of distracts from the real issues, uh, it, it is yeah. uh, frustrating, to say the least. It, it, indeed. And, and what, we're t what we're speaking about here for folks that haven't been tracking this. So Rob Heatherly and a couple of others that, that are helping discovered that there is a group of Wikipedia editors that is highly organized. It's called the Guerrilla Skeptics. They are run by a nonprofit in California called About Time. It's a group of about 150 Wikipedia editors that are that are run by this lady by the name of Susan Gerbic. And they have been doing this since 2010. Essentially, they target any Wikipedia page that they consider pseudoscience. Uh, so they'll go in, they'll rewrite the page, they'll delete stuff, but more importantly, they will rewrite the page to sort of cast doubt on a particular person or a particular subject. They also write and maintain the pages of their debunkers, of their, their fellow debunkers. Uh, so for instance, uh, debun uh, debunker uh, Mick West, a professional debunker Mick West, his page was written and maintained by the guerrilla skeptics. So if you go today, anyone here watching this show, you go to Wikipedia and you look up Mick West, you will see this immaculately, immaculately written page that is perfect, makes him look like a million dollars. And then if you go and you search for David Grush's page or Lou Elizondo's page, you will see the, the they basically, they trash these guys. They do it in a very subtle way using loaded 
language, loaded phrases that if you are a person that is new to this topic and Susan Gerbic, the head of these guerrilla skeptics has publicly stated this, they understand that the number one website that people go to to look for a topic is Wikipedia. I think it's the fourth or seventh most trafficked website in the world. They know that that is the battlefront to counter what they consider pseudoscience. So they, they have in a, a very, very methodical, organized way, have figured out a way to spread this disinformation about these topics. And it's not even UAP. It's things like chiropractic, uh, homeopathy, um, uh, uh, acupuncture. These are all things that that they have targeted. They have, as of, I think it was February 2nd, they had written something like 2,200 Wikipedia pages with over, I think it was 300 million worldwide views. Their effect is, is significant. And the one thing that I would point out as well, if anybody that is a student of history, go and look at the CIA involvement in spreading disinformation throughout American history. Again, this all goes back to the CIA. You had uh, Operation Mockingbird, where, Mockingbird. It was, uh, where it was disclosed in the 70s during a Senate hearing called the, the, uh, the Church Committee that the CIA had been paying U.S. journalists, U.S. journalists, media outlets, media editors to write stories that pushed the CIA talking points. This, of course, was during the Cold War, but essentially the CIA said to a, we'll just say to a reporter, hey, if you want access to all of these people that you want access to to write a great story for the New York Times, you need to scratch our back and we'll scratch yours. And as long as you write stories that are pushing what the CIA, what the, the Department of Defense wants the American public to believe, disinformation will play ball. And all of this came to light in, in, uh, in, in this uh, church committee. And there were also a lot of other abuses by the FBI, uh, the, the CIA, as I just men uh, mentioned, uh, NSA, all of this came to light. But at the end of the day, yeah. the takeaway of that is the CIA paid journalists to push the talking points that they want, that they wanted pushed. Now, supposedly out of the, one of the things out of, out of the church committee, or church commission was that all of that was going to stop. But I, I would posit that this continues today. This continues with the debunkers. Uh, and again, it's different than skeptics. You can be skeptical, but when you are a debunker and you are pushing the talking points, in my view, the amount of time that these debunkers spend doing this. And when you looked at Wiki, when you go and you look at Wikipedia, you'll find that some of these debunkers, particularly this guy named Lucky Louie, who Rob is confident is, is the debunker Mick West. This is literally a full-time job for these people. And when you stop and you think about if you're somebody that is writing this, this crap 10 hours a day, seven days a week, do you think they're doing this for free? No, mm -hmm. I, I, I certainly do not. And it's, it they're is, well paid for this stuff. I they can are promise. Well paid, they are well paid for this stuff. And, and I can tell you members of Congress are aware of this. I would say that members of Congress are very upset about this. And I would, uh, venture to say that there are going to be consequences. It's an, it's an attack on free speech. It is a uh, censor censorship, uh, it's it's it, this is a kind of shit you would expect to happen under in Russia under Vladimir Putin's rule. Cer rule. Yeah, yeah, certainly certainly not in the United States, but it it is occurring. They understand that that this is the best mechanism to spread disinformation. So when you have people like uh, Mick West. Uh, telling Mark von Rennenkamp as as kind of a Freudian slip that that you, Mark you think that the gimbal thing is some aliens flying stuff around and therefore you must be nuts that tells you right away the where debunkers are starting from and they're reverse engineering the con the conversation and twisting facts 
to back into back back the result into the result that they want. Anyway, uh, sorry for that. Sorry for that rant. Well, I, I remember when um, Gresh was interviewed. I think it was on Joe Rogan, and he was talking about how Tim Bruchette, that someone was um, they were dumping a ton of money into some other guy's political. Um, campaign to run against him to try to push him out of office you know Mike i mean Turner. yeah representative they, they Mike Turner, so yeah. much money money and they'll just use it to to trap trash you every chance they get oh for sure yeah uh, like i said we got to keep turner's grubby little hands out of out of any sort of future legislation and and uh i don't know hopefully lockheed martin will, will do the right thing and quit lining this guy's pockets and doing the which bidding is what of, they've been doing yeah this is what they've been doing and they continue to do it and you know folks at the end of the day these folks work for us it's not the other way around so anyway enough of that if you guys have some time we have some really great listener questions i'd love to uh, post to both of you all right let's do it all right david smethurst friend of the show uh, from uh, ufo thinker podcast uh, he appears often on there with frank i'm a huge fan of their show uh, David says, have the guests had any reports of harmful effects being present and then disappearing? Uh, does this indicate that they can be directed like the radiation at Skinwalker Ranch? Is he, I'm not sure what he's talking about when he says harmful effects. You mean directed at them personally or? I think, I think what he is trying to say is perhaps in the literature, there exists evidence of I mean, clearly, clearly there does of harmful effects upon individuals, but sometimes other individuals do not suffer from the same effects. So, uh, is it is <clears throat> does that is that correct? Have you heard that sort of thing before? Yeah, I'm still struggling. I'm not sure I understand exactly the question, but have the guests had any reports of harmful effects being present and then disappearing? So, yeah. So, I guess the question oh, is, oh. they're there and then all of a sudden they're not. And, and, and then I guess you'd have to explore what they mean by harmful effects. But clearly, there's things that happen to people, that physiological things that that happen. And um, then, you know, they may heal or something like that, if that's what he's saying. I'm not sure what he's trying to, if he's suggesting that maybe they're like, I'm not sure. I understand. Yeah. I, uh, Keith? Yeah, I, I don't have any uh, any information about that. But that would be something that would be really good to find out. Uh, and and I look at the uh, the 2010 anomalous acute and subacute field effects on human biological tissues. That was that DIRD Defense Intelligence Reference Document mm -hmm. that really sort of uh, explained a little bit about what people uh, were experiencing as a result of uh, getting exposed. I would also imagine too that you don't know what you're being exposed to you don't know it's not like it's necessarily the same phenomena that's reaching the same people you have all kinds of possibilities this is why we need real scientists doing work on this issue um, not folks who are trying to convince you that it doesn't exist yeah that 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 is for sure actually backing up into the to, into the gorilla skeptics thing, one of one of the things that we found out about, or I found out about, and I had no idea that existed, is this 5013C that is, I think, in Am Amherst, or is somewhere in New York, I think, called the Center for Inquiry. And at first I was like, ah, oh, this yeah, sounds like some local organization, but this thing is freaking huge. It has millions of dollars coming into it large, large wire transactions infusing them and uh, to the tune of like $110,000 uh, uh, US dollar, uh, multiple wires coming into the Center for Inquiry. Uh, this group, they're sort of uh, uh, not board of directors, but kind of the, the bottom rung from that uh, it, on this group, the circle of directors or whatever. You have Mick West that's on there. You have Susan Gerbeck who runs the Gorilla Skeptics. Uh, then you also have Neil deGrasse Tyson. So you have this uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson who is appearing on all these media networks, uh, news networks, as a, a honest broker that is independent. And of course he's, he's spouting all of the, uh, the debunker talking points, but then you find out, oh, by the way, he's in this whole organization. And oh, by the way, the Center for Inquiry, I, I, and we, we, did an, we did an episode where we, we revealed the, the IRS uh, forms 
you know, let's just say that they had $4.7 million coming into this, into this thing. They had, we'll just say like $4 million going out. And oh, by the way, in their IRS form 990, they talk about a program. It's, it was called like secular, uh, secular, uh, uh, relocation program or something crazy. But in that, in that thing, they talk about how a, a large portion of their funding is dedicated to paying journalists and bloggers who are bloggers, the people on Twitter that are spouting all of this bullshit, uh, uh this debunker stuff on there. So I, as going back to what you said, Richard, there, there is a lot of money changing hands. I am hundred percent certain of well, that. And, and now you see how they're getting paid. I mean, it's obvious. Right. That's what they do is they run it through these, you know, funneling the money through these little 503 C's. And yeah. you, what you'd want to see is the list of 1099s they send out. 100%. And, you know, and so when you look at someone like Mick West, who's, I can tell you his spouse does not work. He does not work, lives in the state of California, which is not a cheap place to live. You have to wonder, how is somebody like that and others of his ilk making uh, making a living? And uh, you know, and he stated as well he he gets paid to write articles for the Center of Inquiry. But I would say that it's probably a lot more. And I would certainly say that is the case with video editor slash uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call him um, uh, Stephen Greenstreet at New York Times. He wrote propaganda for the State Department. If that tells you anything, well, Keith, go ahead. And, and and I was just going to say, we need more uh, investigative journalism in the area of disinformation campaigns, active and past. We need to know exactly what's happening, how we're being influenced, and how these topics get poisoned, uh, either directly by these agents or indirectly by others working on their behalf. Um, and it's it's hard work because you know the whole point of the disinformation campaign is not to be found out. Right. But since we are Americans and it's illegal, I think, to conduct those kinds of campaigns against uh, the American public, we should get some really uh, strong investigative journalism to to examine this issue. It's not something that's made up as a conspiracy theory. This is something that a whistleblower has stated exists. And whistleblowers are not just average people that are just saying what they think, and, but they're not sure of. Whistleblowers bring credible and urgent uh, complaints to the inspector general to be dealt with. In, Agreed. In, in whatever what I was going to tell you, say on the other side of that coin, when you're talking about all these debunkers and how well they're paid, if you look at the other side of that coin, the people like me that do all this research um, th this does not pay well, That's you know, right. most of the people that, <laughs> that in my world do it for free, that at least they have, yep. you know, they have their own pensions or whatever. And, 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 but nobody's nobody in, in the, I, I mean, I just don't know of anybody that's a ufologist that's making any kind of money. They just don't. Yep. And, and that might partly be by design too, you know, um, yeah. that, that, um, you know, they're not going to let someone that's that's given really good information out there be too successful, you know. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm a liberal capitalist. I think that there's nothing wrong with making money. It's something you love. You do it in an ethical way. I, I hope one day my dream comes true and I can get paid really well for doing what I'm doing because I absolutely love it. I think it's important. Uh, I enjoy being in front of the camera and I enjoy interviewing people and it would be great to uh, not do it essentially for free. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with that. But I think if you are being paid to uh, to not be a constructive part of the conversation and to sow chaos on Twitter and to sow crazy conspiracy theories uh, like Mick West and, and this other guy, uh, uh, Green Street, it, you know, th that's a different, you sh that's a dirty way of making money in, in my view. Uh, yeah. Okay, here's another question. Schizo, enemy number one, have there been rumors that piqued their, uh, piqued y'all's interest due to them hearing something similar from another person? And if so, what? Have Read been, that again. Uh, so have there been rumors that piqued their interest due to them hearing something similar from another? I'm, you know what? I'm not sure I understand understand that question. 
we're gonna we're gonna skip over that uh David Smithhurst once again uh, does the panel think that the technology used to downcraft by the Office of Global Access uh, directed teams ie uh, electromagnetic pulse or high powered radar etc could have long term effects on the people operating the equipment uh, the equipment I have no way of knowing no um, I'm I'm a consumer of the information just like everyone else uh but certainly uh, the good work of Matt Ford and Chris Sharp and Josh uh, has helped us understand a little better the fact that it's occurring uh, and, and that it's something that the American public should know about and uh, that at least Congress, even if it's classified and we're not able to know the details, at least Congress should be aware of this since they're responsible for paying the bills. Richard, any thoughts? Yeah, I haven't really interviewed anyone that's used any kind of weapons to knock a um, um, a craft down or to, to cause one to crash. So I, I don't know. I think what the person's asking is, are the people that are operating our equipment being is there is there are there health issues with that? And we I don't have any way of knowing. We don't have any way of knowing that. Same, same here. Uh, question from Jonathan R. What is the consensus from the guests about? the NHI and their intentions. Keith, uh, you want to tackle that first? Yeah. So usually when I talk about NHI, I, I simply say, look at the variety of life in on this planet, from microbes to, you know, very intelligent forms of, of life. I would imagine that life that comes from other worlds might have the same kind of uh, uh, variety of, of species. So as far as intent, I don't know that there's a non-human uh, equivalent to, to intent. I, I have no way of knowing. Simply knowing that there's some uh, non-human intelligence that has technology that is much more advanced than us is, is, is all that I, I can determine. Um, you know, Richard, one could gather oh, sorry, intent well, based on, I was going to say, one could maybe surmise intent based on what experiences say they've, they've encountered, but this, that's not really a well-addressed issue. What, what I was going to say is in, in my books, um, the, a couple of the books I've talked about higher levels of human consciousness and, um, if you look at, you know, we're like in third dimension, then there's fourth dimension, fifth dimension, so on. And, and, and what we what we think is that in higher levels of consciousness, uh, they're more ma malevolent. They're, they're the, the, you know, when you get into like fourth and fifth dimensional consciousness, the whole idea of hatred and killing and fighting and all that, none of that exists in those higher realms. And so I think that for the most part, a lot of these ETs are obviously more highly evolved than we are. And they used to, I, the first time I said this, I choked on, I was speaking in a conference and I said, love is the most powerful force in the universe. And uh, I think I've learned that there's probably some truth to that. So I don't think that these higher levels of these entities, um, I, I think if, I mean, if, if look, look at it from their perspective. Okay. It's just get, get one of your saucers and go buzzing around the earth, you know, fly over the Ukraine and watch them blowing up all these people's homes and apartment buildings, then go over to Palestine and see how they're murdering all those people over there. And, you know, if, if you just kind of came down here and buzzed around the earth for a while, you think these people are pretty mean and violent, which yeah. would give you that impression. Right. And so what, you know, how much they want to deal with us is probably in relationship to, us getting more highly evolved where they can put up with us, you know? And, and again, uh, and, and I'd just say that with this caveat that if you look at a lot of the violence and the killing that's going on, the wars, a lot of that stuff is basically financed by the defense contractors. And I don't think the average person, you know, when you sit there, if the average guy and his wife are sitting there watching TV, that there's nothing good about watching somebody over in, um, the Ukraine a family having their apartment building blown up. You know what I'm saying? Most people don't like that. And so the, again, it's the, 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 a lot of the leadership in our world is, 
more geared that way, but I'm wondering how many of the average people feel that way. I don't know. Excellent question. Okay, final question. Uh, Keith, a UFO lands outside your house. Do you call 911? <laughs> yeah, you He's call He's going to call me first, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, call, call 911, yeah. But uh, th th this really speaks to the fact that we're not really taking the issue seriously because there's no way for an adequate response to occur. So what we would do under any other circumstance when something is wrong, we're, we're not able to do so. Like if you see orbs around your house, calling 911 is not going to help mm -mm. much. No. So that's what, that's what we need to address at the local level. National security, they can deal with their issues and also start thinking about things in terms of global security because this is a global issue. They don't just pop up in the United States or in France. This is a global issue, and that's how we should be addressing it. Agreed. Richard, UFO lands outside uh, your backyard. Your wife comes in like, Richard, look what just landed. Do you call 911? No, no. I'm probably going to call some of my um, my guys that, that I work with, and we'll probably be out there with cameras and magnetometers and trying to figure out what's going on. But obviously the night I, I, I can promise you that I know more about this than anybody that would respond on a 911 call, you know, um, at least now. So no, the 911 would not be the option. I think Keith and I were talking about that case um, where the police responded to that um, in Las, in Vegas. Las Vegas and, oh, yes. and, and the, and the, on the, you, something about it the, on the body cam, the one guy said, next time, don't call us or something like that. And Keith goes, that's why we're writing these books and doing this, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. 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 I, I, Cause I, that's the whole case in point. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we're doing this. Was that thing? I, I, I'm much in the same way. I'm not a UFO researcher, more just like a talk show host that enjoys this topic. Was anything ever found out with the Vegas thing? Do you guys think that thing was real or any personal thoughts on that? I, I have no skin so, in the game. I'm just curious. So, so so let me ask that in a question. If there was something substantive, do you think that it would be released to the public? Hell no. Ooh. <laughs> no, okay. no way. No, no way. Absolutely not. Whoa. Right, Keith, uh, excuse me, Dr. Taylor. How can folks uh, f uh, follow your work, support your work? How can... How can people follow what you're doing? So I am active on uh, X, and my handle is at Dr. Keith L. Taylor. Uh, and so I'm busy uh, reposting incredible uh, interviews and videos such as your program. So oh, well, thank you. Uh, that's this is that's where I'm I'm most active regarding this issue. Richard, how can people like buy your book, find your your other, and and quickly yeah. also tell us yeah. about your first two books as well. Okay, the the I've got three books out. The first book was written, and it's being used to train pol investigators, UFO investigators. Um, it was called the Methodology for the New Age, and it it was basically written because these guys for the last fifty years they're going out. They're doing the same thing with the cameras, electronic instruments, and all that. They're not taking into consideration the uh, levels of human consciousness and multidimensional realities and things that occur in these these cases. And so, uh, a lot of the what I wrote in that book has to do with with understanding multidimensional existences and levels of consciousness and things, and also time. Um, you know, how time is manipulated and all that kind of stuff. Second book was written for the public. Um, and that's just what it is. It's basically the same as the law enforcement book is for someone in the general public would read it to understand it and try to come to grips with what's going on. Third book is about the, is written for police. Um, I have a website. It's, it's very simple. It's langpublication.com. And um, if you go on my my website, there's links to buy the books and a little bit more about my bios on there and that kind of thing. But it's just lang, L-A-N-G, publication.com. Awesome. Well, guys, it's been a real pleasure. I've really enjoyed having both of you on. I know, Keith, yeah. we've been speaking for quite some time. And uh, man, this is a really great discussion. And my hat is off to to both of you for your work in this in this topic as I 
continually say this is a team effort. Everyone has a part to play in this, and you guys certainly uh, have been doing just that. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It was good. Good thank experience. Thank you for having Appreciate us, it. and and yeah. we're big fans of your work. Please keep doing the incredible work that you're doing. Yeah, Matt. we, we yeah. certainly appreciate it. I appreciate Espe that. Especially digging it up on the CIA too. That just is <laughs> that needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, I, there, there, I, I, I got some word back that allies there, uh, a handful of allies are very happy about it. But I'm certainly, uh, I'm sure, which I didn't hear, but I'm sure exists that there were lots of people there that weren't too happy about what we wrote. But, you know, at the end of the day, you just have to speak truth to power. And, and uh, you know, we're Americans, we deserve to know the truth that that is it. There you go. There you go. All right, guys, uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. All right. Good night. Thank Take you. Care. All right, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed our show, please tell your uh, tell your friends about us. We also are considering increasing the number of shows we do to two a week. So we we have typically been doing our show on Sunday around noon. Sometimes it's a little bit earlier if a guest isn't available. But part of the reason that we try to do it on Sunday at noon is for our friends across the pond in the UK. So they are able to watch this as well. But we would like to do two shows a week. So the question to everyone, and we ask that you leave a comment in, uh, in, the, on the, uh, in the YouTube comment section is, would you like to see a second show per week? And when would that be? It would either have to be Monday through Thursday, what time we think it would probably be around 6 p.m. Or if we were to do this show on the weekend as well as Sunday, we would likely do it on Saturday at around the same time, probably noon as well. We could do it later in the day, uh, you know, say like six or seven Pacific, but then our friends across the pond in, in the UK, which we have lots and lots of fans here, they would miss out on the live aspect. Uh, of that. But anyway, leave a comment on YouTube. Let us know what you guys would like to see. If you like the content that we're bringing, bringing to you, if there are other forms of content or different types of guests that you would like us to uh, bring, let us know. We, I read all the comments. Uh, I try to respond to most of them. Sometimes I can't, but I do read all of them. So we always appreciate your input, uh, your input and of course your support. So uh, anyway, yeah, so that's it. So uh, we'll hopefully see you again Sunday. Actually, not hopefully. We will see you again Sunday. Monday, tomorrow, we will be announcing who our guest is this coming Sunday. We have an embargo. We can't speak about who that guest will be and what we will be talking about. But we do have a great guest coming up Sunday. And uh, we've got a couple of other great guests lined up for uh, the rest of the month. So thanks for joining us. We appreciate your support and we will see you soon on The Good Trouble Show. Thank you.